great lecture to on the physiology of wheat and in this uh, set of lectures we are going to focus on um, several components of the wheat. We are going to look at the functional anatomy of the eye. After appreciating the functional anatomy of the eye we are then going to look at how images are formed. In looking at how images are formed, we're also going to look at some uh, pathologies that go with with that. After that, we're going to then go into the pathways that are important for your brain to perceive uh, what you are seeing. For example, for a very long time, we have been told that on the retina of the eye, the image is upside down. If that is so, why don't you see upside down? Why does the brain uh, perceive things as upright? Or does it really perceive things as upright? Are you sure that what you see as upright is actually upright? Or maybe it's upside down. So we're gonna learn all of that and we're going to appreciate. But today's lecture is all about functional anatomy. So let us start. So the basic structure of the eye is that it has three major components, okay? And these are known as layers or walls, okay? And um, we have the first type, okay? If you look at your screen, we have the first layer, which in, uh, is known as the fibrous tunic. It has uh, the sclera at the back, or the posterior end of it is known as the sclera and in front of it we have the cornea all right and then right next to that is where we have our vascular system so from the cornea we have the iris okay Posterior to that, we have the choroid. So the choroid is just below the sclera. But between the iris and the choroid is a body known as the ciliary body. Okay, so this is a thickened area, the thickened middle component known as the choroid body. So, um, it extends anteriorly, okay, making a diaphragm known as the iris, okay. And it also has ligaments, if you can see right here, it has ligaments that hold this lens um, in place, okay. And then last but not least, we have the inner layer, which is sensory. So this is known as the retina. So the retina is composed of two uh, components. We have the pigmented layer, which is the melanoid uh, lower layer. Remember, say that with me, melanoid lower layer. And then just above that, or internal, internal, we'll refer to internal as going into the eye and uh, when we say outer, we'll be referring going out of the eye. So we also have the neural layer uh, internally. The neural layer is composed of rods, cones, bipolar cells, and a few other cells that we'll look at in, uh, in detail soon. So, what have we said? The eye, when you look at it from the front, okay, has the eyelid. It also has uh, the brown parts, okay, mostly brown. You can find it blue. Why? Homework, okay. So that blue or brown parts is known as the iris okay 
And now we learned how the iris comes about from the cho choroid body and the space that it leaves in between is known as the pupil. Okay, so if we look at the other diagram, we have the space there, which is the pupil, and the iris. Okay, that from my just coming from the uh, from the from the choroid body. I beg your pardon. And then we have the ciliary body here, which holds the ligaments that hold the lens. Okay, we can't see the lens from this side. Um, from this other side, the whitish part is known as the sclera. Okay, so we also have the sclera um, and covering it, of course, is the cornea. Okay, so we have the cornea there. Um, what else? Okay, so going inside, of course, um, another component that you would be very interested in is the conjunctiva. Okay, so we have the conjunctiva right there. Okay, so we have also muscles that uh, hold the eyeball in place. So let's go back. We have three areas. And these areas are known as the fibrous components, which have the sclera, which are the outer components. The sclera in front is the cornea, okay? Then you have the vascular part, which um, consists of the choroid body. The choroid body has in front of it uh, the iris. And in between it is the ciliary body. Now, as I said, uh, it, has, it is a thickened part, which uh, extends anteriorly to form uh, this iris component and then the ligaments hold the lens. Very important for you to um, know that. So let's go ciliary body there. Okay. Having appreciated that, uh, let's get on to the fluid. So when you look at the inside of the ball, we have uh, several fluids, by several I mean a couple, all right? So we have a fluid that is known as the vitreous humor, okay? The vitreous humor um, is jelly-like. So from the retina, remember the retina was the inside part where the neural uh, component is. So from the retina to um, the ciliary body area, you have this vitreous humor, the jelly-like fluid. It is made of uh, proteins and doesn't really flow, okay? Then just anterior to the lens, we have the aqueous humor. This one is freely flowing, okay? Now both of them are there to maintain the structure of the eye. And, and therefore they have this intraocular pressure that they maintain of about 10 to 20 millimeters of mercury. And any increase in this pressure might cause pathologies. So the humor also does provide nutrition to the avascular areas, the areas that do not have vascular systems, okay? So they also, um, work at getting rid of waste metabolites. So if we critically look at uh, the production and circulation of the aqueous humor, we would first start by appreciating the fact that they are produced by the ciliary body. Now, if you do not remember where the ciliary body is, I have put these four 
diagrams here to help us remember. So in the, okay, so from the choroid and then you have the iris in the middle, you have the ciliary body, remember that. So posterior to it is the vitreous chamber and anterior to this, we have the aqueous. So we're looking at the aqueous chamber, at the aqueous humor, at the aqueous fluid. So how is it made? Um, so for, for, for the ciliary body, if we uh, enlarge it, we are going to have uh, the diagram in, in circuit in blue, okay? So this diagram has a ciliary process, okay? which is covered with ciliary cells, okay? If we enlarge in this part, how do these cells look like? Um, these cells have a stroma component and epithelium. If we enlarge in that component, then we have our ciliary uh, stroma, okay? Making the basement membrane, and then we have the epithelium. So this is what we're going to look at and understand how uh, the, the humor is um, produced. So specifically, we're going to look at the stroma and the epithelial cells. Um, so the epithelium and the stroma work together in order for the aqueous humor to be produced. So let's just look at the diagram, then we'll come to the knots. Uh, first of all, you see that there is a secretion into the aqueous uh, chamber of chloride ions as well as uh, sodium ions, so sodium chloride that is salt, okay? And then you also have potassium uh, uh, coming out. And then, not shown, we also have a little bit of, um, not a little bit, but water coming into the area as a form of um, osmotic poop because ions are going into this aqueous chamber you find that they have this osmotic poop but let's see where they're starting from so from the stroma end we have sodium chloride and potassium going into the uh, the, the first cells so once they go into the first uh, uh, epithelial cells from the stroma you find that they can the chloride ions have a passage into uh, uh, the next epithelial cells that then um, get it into the aqueous chamber. But not only does chloride ions go through that, or this is not the only source of chloride ions. We also have chloride ions coming in as an exchange with bicarbonates. Okay. So once the chloride ions come in, then they can take the first route and go into the aqueous chamber. Um, we also have the sodium uh, ions coming in. So when the sodium ions come in, they have passage into the epithelial cells, which then get into um, the aqueous chamber through the potassium uh, sodium pump. Then we also have another channel through which potassium uh, goes through. So basically, these are the, the, the channels that are involved in making of the ionic component of the aqueous humor. So with this passage of um, ions, you have this osmotic pool of water into the aqueous chamber, making the final fluids. But other than the ions, we also have secretions of ascorbic acids and glucose and amino acids as well to make about 2.5 microliters drainage daily uh, of the anterior component um, uh, fluids, which is the aqueous humor. So this is how the aqueous humor is made. It is important for you to understand that the sodium chloride are very imperative together with the potassium ions and then on top of this we have a, an osmotic pool and then we also have ascorbic acids glucose and amino acids joining in to make the final aqueous humor um so from the point of their from the point of their production 
which is the ciliary body this is their passage so if you could follow how these are moving the arrows okay so the aqueous tumor is formed it goes anteriorly okay and then from the uh, aqueous tumor uh, chamber they go okay into this pathway into the trabecular pathway now the trabecular pathway is a pathway where they exit this chamber and I want to talk about it a bit so this pathway has a, a mesh wake okay before they leave this chamber they have to go through a mesh now this mesh is just tissue that is present and it's it's around uh, it, first you have the ciliary body um, and then the iris now on top of the iris that is where it, it is it is found so it is around this area and it surrounds or it encloses this a canal a hole through which the uh, fluid can pass through and this one is known as the Schlem's canal all right so let's just read what we've written there so the meshwork um, is a tissue it's present around the ciliary body to drain the fluid and maintain pressure that is what it's for so the humor moves through this pathway and it goes to the canal uh, through the trabecular uh, meshwork okay and the meshwork also has fluids in within uh, uh, before everything goes into the Schlem uh, canal uh, where do things go after that so we have collecting uh, channels all right we have the veins that then drain into uh, other we have venues that then drain into veins okay and then we also have other channels of release of this particular fluid so the fluid does not stay in the eyeball it goes to the rest of the body now we see that with edge the the mesh work becomes sclerotic okay and may result in uh, drainage resistance and this may lead to uh, a pressure buildup which is known as uh, glaucoma so that is one of the diseases that come with age uh, this slide is there is uh, just to highlight the fact that we have several uh, canals through which uh, these fluids can pass so if the ciliary bodies release uh, they can either join the vitreous cavity, which we haven't talked about really, uh, but mostly we talked about uh, the anterior chamber. Um, so from the anterior chamber, we find that it goes through the trabecular meshwork, uh, where it goes through the canal, and from the canal, it can go through the veins, um, and so on and so forth. So it shows you various uh canals that are present within the eyeball just to appreciate um something that this also brings about is the exchange between the cornea and the anterior area um, and also the anterior chamber and the lens area um, that's very good to appreciate i'd like to find out why would this exchange exchange of 11 what do you think it's all about um, go back to the other two um, functions that I gave you of uh, these fluids and it will bring about uh, much light uh, last but not least we want to apply a few things so not only does age cause this uh, sclerosis of the meshwork, but we find that sometimes there's debris in the fluid that may cause clogging, okay? So this may lead to secondary glaucoma. Um, now, the system is kept free of these eventualities because we have several drainages that we have talked about. But 
the meshwork can sometimes be clogged okay the meshwork also has macrophage which is there to just eat up all these extra um, uh, non you uh, particles okay and this helps to clean uh, the fluid um, sometimes things happen around that angle uh, leading to a pressure buildup and resulting in a degradation of the retina. So let's just see the two types of uh, clogging or the two types of um, uh, problems that may occur that may lead to this pressure buildup. So we're going to look at open angle and closed angle glaucoma. Either way, we're looking at a pressure buildup that may result. Let's start with open angle so in open angle the we, we see that the fluid is freely flowing all the way to the trabecular but the on the trabecular area we find that the meshwork is blocked okay so because the meshwork is blocked we find that the anterior chamber though open is now being blocked of drainage so because it is blocked of drainage it is called open angle okay it's open it's flowing through but it can drain away so because it can drain away we find a pressure buildup what about closed angle so closed angle starts all the way from um, the drainage of the aqueous being fully blocked by let's say in this case we have the iris okay the iris is completely blocking this angle of drainage you compare it to the other one in this one we have the drainage coming out open and the sorry the passage uh, coming out of the fluid coming out is open and even the drainage is open okay but the meshwork is closed in this case we have fluid coming out but when it goes to the angle of drainage, it is closed. Okay, so we find that the anterior chamber has a closed angle of drainage. So the meshwork might be working, it might be unclogged, but it's just closed. There's nowhere that drainage can uh, uh, go through or the drainage can continue flowing. So those are the differences, and both of them lead to this buildup, this increase in pressure. Um, okay, so take uh, some 10 minutes, and then we'll go to uh, the second uh, slide, the second set of slides. So that was an introduction to uh, parts of the eye and what might happen if there was a pressure buildup uh, that is, especially of the aqueous. We are concentrating on the aqueous because it's the, the more mobile of the two, all right? But it can also apply pressure on the vitreous, which is non-mobile, causing pressure on the entire eyeball.